Welcome to the Gottesdienst crowd, where we foster confessional integrity, liturgical preservation, and preaching that doesn't stink. We believe that the historic liturgy of the divine service is more than mere cobwebs of antiquity, but it is a true treasure of the church to be dusted off and brought down from her attic to be enjoyed. So let's get dusting. Welcome back to the Godestine's Crowd. This is Jason Broughton, your host. Today we have back with us a, a special guest and a good friend of mine, Corey Moss. He is uh, ordained in the ministerium of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, and he is currently serving as professor of history at Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan. Welcome back, Corey. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been a while, but... Uh, I had seen that you gave a couple of presentations at the Redeemer Conference, which is kind of on the front end of the Fort Wayne Symposia series on Scripture, in particular, the sufficiency of Scripture and the clarity of Scripture. And it just seems to me that this is a really uh, appropriate topic for uh, Lutherans today to take up, especially looking at kind of uh, what doctrines are under attack now and what the posture of your average layman in the pew is with regard to, can we actually say, did God say uh, such and such? And uh, more and more, it seems as though uh, we're resting on something else besides scripture. So could you take us through um, briefly, you know, what, we mean by the sufficiency of Scripture and the clarity of Scripture, and then what we don't mean. Yeah, absolutely. And just maybe a little bit of background here. Um, the, the, the two presentations that I gave at, at Redeemer um, in part grew out of a, a Bible study that I was doing here on campus, where it, it kind of became obvious to me that for a variety of reasons, I'm, I'm going to probably credit or blame most of it just on the kind of you know, American evangelical milieu in which we all swim, um, that, that, that a number of, of Lutherans that I was talking to had kind of taken on board um, what, what I considered not necessarily Lutheran understandings of scripture alone. Uh, maybe they were kind of borrowing that language and uh, the, the the freight that came with it from you know other Protestants that they knew, or maybe they were accepting caricatures of the doctrine that they had heard from, for example, you know Roman Catholic friends, um, and so this this began as a, a kind of way to you know kind of clarify concisely what exactly do Lutherans mean when we use these kind of catchphrases like uh, you know sola scriptura or uh, the the clarity of Scripture. So, well, let, let's begin with um, the sufficiency of Scripture, or Scripture alone. I mean, think of, of something like Luther writing the small called articles that the Word of God shall establish articles of faith and, and no one else. So, you know, this is the job of Scripture and, and only Scripture, no one else, not even an angel, he says. Um, and that gets repeated in the formula, um, and then one of the authors of the formula, of course, Martin Chemnitz in his Enchiridion, I think kind of nicely captures a number of things that had been said in the confessions and, and says this, the Holy Spirit included in scripture, the sum of the whole heavenly doctrine, as much as is necessary for the church and suffices for the faith by which believers obtain eternal life. And he nicely captures two emphases there, um, that, that what you have in Scripture is what is necessary and sufficient for the faith uh, by which believers obtain eternal life. So, in other words, uh, if we're going to articulate a doctrine and require Christians to believe it, uh, we have to be confident uh, and, and clear that... This is a necessary doctrine because it's found in Scripture, and that uh, Scripture by itself is sufficient to establish this doctrine. Mm. Um, so on the one hand, that's what we're saying about you know, the, the nature of Scripture itself. 
Um, the other question, what, what do we mean by the clarity of scripture? Um, and we can use the, the same kind of vocabulary, that when we talk about scripture's clarity, we're saying that scripture is you know, sufficiently clear with respect to those doctrines necessary for salvation. So scripture itself is sufficient for those doctrines, and on those doctrines, it is sufficiently clear. So if that's the kind of positive statement, um, what, what's the other side? What, what do we not necessarily mean when we talk about scripture alone, its sufficiency, or uh, the clarity of scripture? Um, yeah, and, we, and maybe you could go into also, you know, what, the, what these two doctrines of scripture uh, or statements about scripture, namely its sufficiency and clarity, what they are, what they stand against, what they are meant to, uh, uh, to defeat or to argue against. Yes, absolutely. And this, this is, I mean, this is really crucial because the, you know, the, the particular articulation of these doctrines with the reformers in the 16th century and the dogmaticians in the 17th century um, is in response to you know, a very particular line of argument and set of assumptions that had grown up in the church. Um, well, let's, let's start with uh, sufficiency then. Um, and, and what is it not responding to? You know, it's not responding to the kind of claim that you might hear in the modern world from an agnostic or, or even for that matter, you know, a kind of liberal mainline Christian who says, well, scripture is not sufficient because it's, it's, it's not in all of its parts inspired, you know, so it's, it's, it's got errors. And so we've, we've got to come to scripture um, with the aid of human reason or modern science or something like that. But scripture by itself isn't sufficient. Um, you know, that's not the kind of thing anyone in the 16th century was arguing. Um, what they were saying is that scripture isn't the only revelation of God that is available to the church. So for example, um, oral tradition that you know, was delivered by Christ or by the apostles themselves uh, was maintained in the church even though it was never written down in scripture. And so you've got a, what's often referred to as a, as a two source theory of revelation. So you've got written scripture and unwritten tradition. And because there are things in unwritten tradition that are not in the written scripture, Roman Catholics, for example, would say, well, then scripture isn't sufficient to, to reveal to us all of the doctrines necessary for salvation, that there are some others that were passed on orally. So that was one of the, the things that the reformers were responding to. Um, if you're familiar with, with what's sometimes referred to as the, you know, the kind of three-legged stool of Catholicism, you know, you've got scripture yeah. on the one hand, uh, you've got tradition on the other hand, um, and then thirdly, uh, the magisterium. And, and with respect to the magisterium, we, we might talk about what the clarity of scripture was specifically responding to. Uh, and that was the idea that, you know, even if scripture were a sufficient source of doctrine, scripture is not sufficiently clear that we can be confident that we're reading it correctly and, and properly understanding doctrine. And for that reason, the, the, the living magisterium, the, the Pope and the bishops in communion with him, especially when they're sitting in an ecumenical council, um, they bring to scripture uh, a clarity that, that scripture doesn't have by itself. Um, so yeah, the, the way that, that Lutherans and, and other Protestants in the 16th century talked about the sufficiency and clarity of scripture was, was mainly a response to, to those two trends. Now does... Uh... Does the the Roman understanding of how Scripture actually came to us play into this at all? And and what I mean by that is, uh, oftentimes I will hear 
well, the church existed before the scriptures. Therefore, um, they're the, uh, the church is the determining factor of what is scripture and what isn't. Does that play into it at all? And I, of course, I'm, I'm probably kind of flubbing that argument a little bit and, and oversimplifying it. Um, well, no, I mean, it, 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 it does come into it um, in, a, in a couple of ways. And, you know, how to do this as clearly and concisely as possible. Well, let, let's begin with this. So the, the idea that, you know, the church, however we're going to define that term, you know, gave us scripture. And therefore that the church, you know, in some sense, uh, to put it crassly, you know, grants authority to scripture um, is is a common apologetic line uh, in in the Roman Catholic world. I mean, th- th- there, there are ways in talking about the church giving us scripture that are, of course, not problematic. Right. Uh, I mean, if you, if you believe like Luther um, correctly, that, that the church exists from the creation itself with Adam and Eve, well, then, yeah, of course, the church predates, you know, the written books of the Bible. Um, even if you want to say that the church gave us scripture in the sense that it are, it is members of the church, the apostles who are composing scripture. It is, you know, congregations of the church that are, you know, copying and preserving scripture. You know, all of that is perfectly fine. But if the argument is that you know, the book of Romans or the gospel of Matthew has no authority until you know the, the the church through some official mechanism the decree of a council or a pope you know grants it that authority well that's obviously hugely problematic mm-hmm. which is which is the kind of claim that you're not going to hear m- most responsible 21st century catholic theologians making um, but it is the kind of thing um that was quite regularly heard uh, in the 16th century. Um, who was it? I think it was the the, the, fac- the theology faculty of the University of Cologne. No, shoot, I'm 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 forgetting the reference. Um, but there are a number of individual theologians. Um, Gerhard quotes some of them who talk about the scriptures having as much authority as the fables of Aesop until uh, the, the church kind of grants them authority. Um, wow. Yeah, which again is, is not the kind of thing that, that you're going to hear most Catholics saying today. Although... Um, I did. I did just recently read this. Um, it was online. Take it. Take it for what it's worth. But but on a rel- relatively popular Roman Catholic website, um, the, the the author says this: uh, we, we do not do what Protestants have done and start our own ecclesial communities, clinging only to a book that has no authority without the true Church. Um, so that kind of gets at the. The, the kind of extreme articulation of this, that well, you know, yeah. scripture has no authority unless it's granted by the church. Therefore, interpretations of scripture have no authority unless granted by the church. And if scripture has no authority without the church, then what the church says, even without scripture, can be deemed authoritative. Mm-hmm. And therefore necessary for salvation. Yeah, that that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Um, so it's not simply we're, we're not simply talking about you know traditions, for example, liturgical traditions um, that you know might be traced through the tradition, not found mm-hmm. in scripture. Um, they're 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 useful for the sake of good order, uh, for the cultivation of piety. Um, but adherence to them is not strictly necessary for salvation. You know, that's a very different thing than saying you know, the church has defined uh, one of the Marian dogmas, 
and we consider this to be part of the deposit of faith, and therefore you cannot doubt or deny this without falling outside of salvation. And so the Reformers put forward the sufficiency of Scripture to articulate really what are necessary saving doctrines and what aren't. That's right. If, 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 you're going to, if you're going to say that doctrine X or doctrine Y is, is necessarily a part of the deposit of faith, necessary for salvation, then they said you have to be able to point to that in the pages of Scripture itself. Was there discussion, too, on what was Scripture and what wasn't in the 16th century? In other words, what were the authoritative books that everyone knew uh, could be uh, stated as Holy Scripture and what weren't? In other words, did they make distinctions between the 66 books that we currently have in our Bibles uh, or even you know, what was in the Apocrypha to say, these are more sure and these are less sure? So we can, we can base... Uh, we can base a, a necessary doctrine for the salvation of your soul from these books, but not so much from these books? Or how do they handle that? Yeah, good question. Um, so the, there, are, there are a couple things going on here. O- obviously, there are debates about the nature and scope of the canon itself. Um, and so Rome, for example, wants to include the, the Deuterocanonical or the Apocryphal Old Testament books. Um, so, so that's going to have to be a debate. Um, but as part of that debate, there's, of course, a question about, well, how, how would we answer that question? You know, what, what are the criteria by which that, that question might be answered? And everyone on both sides of the divide wants to appeal, you know, to, to, to the early church. Um, mm-hmm. the, the problem there, of course, is that uh, the early church and in fact, the medieval church um, is very divided on whether, you know, first and second Maccabees are, are part of the canon or not. Um, and so Lutherans uh, feel quite confident in saying, you know, look, um, this has never been formally defined by the church. And there's a good reason it's never been formally defined by the church, because the church has never actually agreed on this all the way back to antiquity, um, which is a which is a pretty good argument when it comes to you know the Old Testament apocryphal books. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, you know, going back to the sources, the, they're also well aware of the fact that there are some books, even of the New Testament, that the church now and for, for the last 1500 years has agreed upon, but within the first 500 years, there was a little bit of debate about, you know, whether Revelation should be part of the canon, uh, whether James and, and Hebrews ought to be part of the canon. Um, and without getting too far into the weeds about, you know, what, what those debates were about and how they were settled, um, it, it, it does it, it does lead some reformers to say, well, we, we need to make a, a bit of a distinction. So the, there are books that we all accept that were spoken against by, by some of the, the earliest Christians. Mm-hmm. And so we're, we consider them canonical, but if at all possible, we should we should, not base uh, a fundamental doctrine on, you know, for example, one quotation from one of these previously disputed books. Um, you know, if, if it's if it's an important central doctrine, it, it should be found elsewhere in the New Testament, or or be confirmed uh, or supported elsewhere in the New Testament. So maybe, for the sake of consistency, we'll we'll accept them as canonical, but try not to make a particular passage in one of these books foundational for a full-blown doctrine of the church. So uh, so their concern through all of this is uh, that there is certainty in what we believe uh, 
uh, uh, so that our consciences aren't held captive by anything that would lead us astray. Is that right? Well, no, that, that's right. And this is, this is one of the things that I, I think too infrequently comes into the discussion when we're talking about sola scriptura and the sufficiency of scripture, um, that the reason Lutherans insist that only scripture defines doctrine is because the, of the prior claim that that only scripture is infallible. You know, only scripture can believe can be believed with with certainty because it's the inspired word of God. You know, in other words, when when we talk about scripture alone, we of course don't mean to exclude reading the church fathers. Mm -hmm. or for that matter, listening to the sermons that our pastors preach on Sunday morning. Um, yeah, hopefully not. I yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what, um, what, what we're saying is church fathers, as, as edifying and informative as it is to read them, they can be wrong. You know, pastors, as necessary as they are, um, they can make mistakes sometime. And so... The only authority that we have that that is infallible is Scripture itself, mm -hmm. and so we can we can implicitly and with certainty put our confidence in the words of Scripture in a way that we can't in anything else. And so, how does then clarity play into that? That we have established that the sufficiency is that Scripture is sufficient to establish all necessary and saving doctrine uh, by which uh, Christians must believe in order to be saved. How, do, how does clarity play into that, the clarity of Scripture? Yeah, so um, here's the way Gerhard uh, in his commonplaces nicely summarizes it. Um, why does God speak to his people through Scripture? Well, because he wants them to know, you know who he is, what he's done for their salvation, and, and therefore he wants us to know what, what is necessary for salvation. Um, well, if that's the purpose that God re for which God reveals himself in Scripture, we can probably assume that he wants us to know these things and therefore he he revealed them he spoke them with clarity enough that we could actually understand what he's saying hmm. you know that 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 this was not you know a kind of riddle of the sphinx i'm going to say some cryptic things and whoever's smart enough to figure out what i'm saying under these levels of obscurity you know they'll be saved but but everyone else hmm. Yeah, that they're just kind of along for the ride. So and they're not yes. Delphic oracle tricks. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so Gerhard says, you know, obviously one one cannot doubt that God could speak explicitly and clearly through His apostles and prophets, uh, and that that He wanted to speak clearly is revealed from the end for which He recorded Scripture. So God spoke so that we might have salvation. God desires our salvation. But precisely because he desires our salvation, he spoke in such a way that we could actually understand what is necessary for that mm -hmm. end. So when we speak about the clarity of Scripture, we are very uh, explicit in terms of everything that is necessary for our salvation, all doctrines, and what a Christian must believe has been not only sufficiently established by scripture but has been clearly stated in scripture and the opposite is it, it, it's not to say that we will automatically understand everything that is in scripture no that that's right yeah and this that's an important emphasis to avoid kind of accepting the caricature that is often provided with respect to this doctrine so when we say that scripture is clear we do not mean, or at least we should not mean, because it's not what Luther <laughs> and the Reformers themselves meant, we should not mean that everything in Scripture is absolutely clear. And it's absolutely clear to everyone who reads Scripture. Um, no. Um, I mean, Luther himself 
um, even in in his debate with Erasmus, and, and the bondage of the will is is where Luther forwards some of his most kind of emphatic claims for the clarity of Scripture. Um, but even in that context, he says, you know, some texts are are still obscure. Um, and he offers a couple of reasons for 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 that possibility. Um, mm-hmm. That there might be passages of Scripture that are obscure because we just we don't actually understand the words that are being used there. I mean, I think probably your your listeners understand this if they you know grew up reading the King James Bible in in grade school. Mm-hmm. Uh, what what does propitiation mean? Um, but I mean, even when we're talking about you know the ancient languages, um, as as m- most people are aware, you know something like the ninety five theses uh, debating indulgences begin by emphasizing that the whole penitential system is in part based on a misunderstanding of, of a biblical term. The, the, the Greek word metanoia, which, which means repentance, having a change of heart or a change of mind, um, got translated in the Latin Vulgate of the Middle Ages, not as, as repent, but as, as do penance. Mm-hmm. So if, if you don't understand the Greek term, well then what Jesus is saying there becomes unclear. Scripture isn't unclear. But, but somebody's translation of scripture has, has made it so. So uh, in terms of kind of where we're at today, uh, how do you find uh, from outside the Lutheran church and even from within the Lutheran church, these two doctrines coming under attack or needing again to be uh, reemphasized? Um, well, in I, I suppose in a number of ways. Um, you know, probably at a practical level, um, in, in inter-Christian debates, you know, whether this is, you know, polemics or a a more kind of fruitful and positive ecumenical conversation, um, you know, clearing away the, the caricatures and the confusions is, is eminently worth emphasizing, um, I mean, so, so for example, um, and I, I use this example in the presentation, Carl Keating uh, is a Roman Catholic apologist, uh, a, a convert to Catholicism, if I recall, and has kind of made it his mission to you know, explain why everyone should leave Protestantism and become Catholic. Um, and, in, and in one of his books, he's talking about you know, the kind of Protestant and especially fundamentalist understanding of sola scriptura. And he summarizes it this way. Anything extraneous to the Bible is simply wrong or hinders rather than helps one toward salvation. Now, I mean, to, to the extent that his Catholic readers pick up his book and think that's actually the Protestant understanding of Sola Scriptura, um, they're going to be thoroughly confused about why any Protestant could be silly enough to believe that. Um, and may not be aware that, surprise, surprise, you know, there really aren't any Protestants that <laughs> believe that. Um, so, I mean, just kind of clarifying what it is that we actually mean, because let, I mean, let's be honest. Once once we start once we start using pithy little phrases like sola scriptura, sufficiency of scripture, that they, they become kind of substitutes for a longer, more fulsome explanation. And so even we ourselves can kind of forget what these doctrines originally meant and, and what they're intended to mean today. So you know, avoiding misunderstanding by, by emphasizing what these doctrines don't mean. And, and once you kind of clear away all of the bad understandings, you're left with you know, the original salutary understanding. And that begins to make a whole lot more sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen this a a number of times, um, you know, over the last few years. Uh, I I remember one, uh, quite dramatically, there was a a visiting theologian was on campus and he gave a 
gave a paper, which was quite well attended. And there was a, a round table and question and answer afterwards. And uh, one of the questioners, as part of the question, kind of briefly summarized you know, the, the Protestant understanding of scripture alone. And right after the presentation, uh, another faculty member kind of ran up and said, you know, we need to talk more about this because I've, I've never heard Sola Scriptura explained that way before. And I've always wondered, you know, why Protestants could possibly believe Scripture alone is sufficient. Um, so, I mean, this is a you know, relatively well-educated professor who had never actually heard a, a responsible presentation of, of the Protestant doctrine of Sola Scriptura. Huh. Well, that's scary. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, well, and, and, and I don't know uh, if that's uh, uh, our fault or his. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably a little bit of both. Um, but this, the same, uh, the same thing with respect to the clarity of Scripture. Um, I mean, the, the the minute that we say Scripture is clear, and somebody else hears in that statement that everything in scripture is blindingly obvious, they're going to think to themselves, well, what's blindingly obvious is that the clarity of scripture is wrong because right. not everything in scripture is obvious. Um, and there are some things in scripture that will probably not become clear at all this side of the eschaton. Right. And so, so we want to kind of redirect the discussion back to you know, what Luther, what the confessions, what the dogmaticians are saying, and and that is that 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 Scripture is clear, or at least sufficiently clear, with respect to those things that are necessary for salvation. And and even there, again, that doesn't mean automatically clear. I mean that there, you have to read in context. You can't just open your Bible, read a particular verse, and, and expect to fully understand it. Um, they're not going to be clear to everyone. Um, you know, th th there's an assumption here that Scripture is clear to people who can actually read it. Right. Um, and perhaps, in some instances, uh, we might go further and say Scripture is going to be clear to those who can read it in its original language, not in a translation, especially a translation that might have uh, confused things or muddied the waters. Um, so yeah, once once those things are clarified, I think it becomes much more obvious why both the sufficiency and the clarity of Scripture were articulated in the first place and, and why they remain coherent. Yeah, there... Uh... There seems to be, you know, within uh, within our church, uh, a desire to know the Bible um, and have immediate access to it. And there's a, a really uh, th there's a, a lot of frustration that goes when there isn't. And uh, I wonder how the clergy of the Missouri Synod uh, might be helpful in trying to help explain this to your, you know, to the people without having to sit down and read the small cult articles or the formula <laughs> conquered with them. Um, again, I mean, that would be great. Uh, but sure. then again, there's a, there's a lot of uh, explanation that would have to go along with that. Uh, how do you, how do we begin to approach um, discussing these things uh, with uh, you know, with the, the average layman in our pew? Yeah, that's a, that's a huge question. Um, and, and I don't know that there's a, a simple answer. Sure. I, mean, I, think, I think probably the, the place where this begins it, is in Bible class, where, where rather than it kind of explaining how to do this, that they actually see it being done. So, mm. you know, we're, we're, we're reading through you know, this book of the New Testament, 
but rather than you know just kind of reading a verse out loud and then going around the tables and everyone can explain what I think this means and what I think this means, uh, you know the, the the pastor kind of models how do we look at this passage in light of you know what the author of the book has has said already in that book what the author of this particular you know epistle says in other of his epistles um, how he's building on what's already been revealed in the old testament um, and and that kind of demonstration that, that that scripture is actually you know the, the coherent and and unified revelation of god himself and so if we really want to understand it and and, and understand it as, as well and as much as possible, um, we, we need to read scripture you know, as a whole. Um, I mean, some obvious examples. I mean, if you're reading Paul on justification and you know, James on justification, I mean, that's, that's a good opportunity to emphasize that, you know what, you can't just open to James chapters two and say, oh, here's a verse that says justification is not by faith alone. Wow, that's really clear. Therefore, you know, Lutherans have it all wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, you, know, you, you point back to Galatians and Ephesians and Romans, and you, you talk about reading in context. Uh, and Melanchthon makes this point uh, in the Apology that, you know, we say that, that Scripture's inspiration and infallibility are unique. You know, there aren't other inspired books. There aren't other infallible books. And yet when it comes to reading scripture, you know, the, the same rules apply to reading scripture as apply to reading other literature. You, know, you, have to, you have to read it in context. And if you do that, things start to become clearer. Um, I think also... Um, one of the things that, that the reformers, for example, emphasize again and again is that when we talk about uh, the sufficiency of scripture, that doesn't mean we can't read church fathers. Uh, when we talk about the clarity of scripture, that doesn't mean that we can't read church fathers. And so, you know, Bible class is a good opportunity to perhaps introduce um, our parishioners to the church fathers and to point out to them that, you know, it, it kind of sounds like maybe this is the case. Let, let's see what people throughout the history of the church have said. Um, oh, look, there's a pretty astonishing consistency in the interpretation mm-hmm. of this verse. Um, maybe, m- maybe it's pretty clear. Um, and incidentally, um, if, you, if you point people to the church fathers, um, they'll realize that, oh, actually the church fathers do profess scripture alone oh mm-hmm. actually the church fathers do profess the clarity of scripture um, you know this isn't something that that we just made up in the 16th century so you see a lot of college kids um uh, i assume you know the normal percentage of lutherans slash missouri synod lutherans that exist within you know america as a whole yeah what are the things that you see within, uh, let's just say, Missouri Synod Lutherans that they need uh, more emphasis on in terms of uh, their uh, theological, their spiritual formation? Wow, again, really good question and, and, and big question. Um, I guess you know, like, yeah. what are the things that they're under attack most? Right. That they that they find um, uh, themselves ill prepared to respond yeah. to. Good question. Um, l- let me let me start with this. I mean, I, I I'm not sure that the, the the college students that I'm normally engaging with are a representative sample of Missouri <laughs> Senate. You know, college students. Sure. Um, but you know, having having dealt with college students elsewhere and Missouri Synod students uh, elsewhere, I, I I think it's probably safe to say that on the whole, they they know very well what the position 
of the Missouri Synod is. Um, you know, that is to say, you know, th they know what they had to memorize in confirmation about the nature of baptism, the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. um, and they know it well, and they believe it firmly, but they don't necessarily know the, the why. You know, why have Lutherans articulated the doctrine this way? Um, and, and what sorts of things prompted them to do so. And if, if anything, w what I see regularly is, is very well educated Lutheran teenagers, very confident that, that Lutheranism in what it teaches is correct but partly confident because they've never actually heard what, what other people believe. Um, and therefore they don't know what Lutheranism has, has kind of developed you know, against, so to say. Um, and so when they're confronted with, for the very first time with, you know, an alternative way of thinking about things or looking at things, they're, they're a little bit upset. Like, well, hmm. you know, Lutheranism seemed really obviously true when I didn't have anything to compare it with. Um, and so now that I'm hearing a, another perspective, I, I, I don't really know what to do with that. Right. Um, I mean, this is, I mean, on the one hand, this, this is what I see. Uh, on the other hand, how to deal with that. Uh, yeah. yeah, that is really a difficult uh, question, you know, because the the average pastor's catechetical pile then just gets even larger. No, that that's exactly uh, right. And uh, at some point, you know, you, you kind of have to have a distribution of these duties either at home or 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 somewhere, and and perhaps college is the place where uh, that is meant to happen, you know, or later high school, and if it's in an environment where there are knowledgeable people that can walk you through it, all the better, right? And that makes it all the more important to choose the right college. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. Well, and, and I mean, yeah, you, re, you refer to the, the catechetical pile. Um, that, yeah, there's, I mean, you got, you got to start somewhere. And yeah. I, my guess is that, you know, good catechesis throughout the LCMS looks something like this. Um, you, you start from, from the earliest of age, and I'm talking about the kind of parish setting here, not necessarily what's happening in the home, but mm -hmm. because of limited amount of time, you, you start kids in Sunday school with Bible stories. Um, and they, they learn the Bible stories, so they've got you know, a, a, a cache of biblical knowledge which can be drawn on when they get to confirmation class. In confirmation mm -hmm. class, you you emphasize the catechism and get get the basics of the catechism down, building on the Bible stories. Um, and then after confirmation, what happens? Well, that's that's a real question um, yeah. because that's that's where the consistency starts to break down. But if you think of something like um, you know, Dorothy Sayers' old essay on classical education and the the, the classical trivium, you mm -hmm. know the the, the quote-unquote grammar stage where you you just kind of memorize, um, and then the, the logic stage where you begin to make logical connections between the the data that you've memorized, um, and then the, the the rhetoric stage where you begin to do more interesting things with that uh, and and pleasing prose and whatnot. I mean, I I would. I would suspect that most of our Sunday school through confirmation is, is really still in the grammar stage. This is what scripture says. This is what the small catechism says, you know, get that yeah. all in your mind. Great. Um, and once we're done with that, we often don't have time or sometimes the resources to move on from there and you know, dig deeper and draw some of the logical conclusions. Well, if this is true for these reasons, here are the things that must not be true. Um, yeah. 
And there so, are. Go ahead. So in essence, then you also then have parents raising those children who are in a sense stuck also in that grammar stage. Yeah, that, that's, in, that's entirely possible. That's entirely possible. Um, and, and perhaps because, I mean, they're, they're getting much more. Um, you know, they're attending adult Bible class, mm-hmm. um, so that they're getting much more information, but it might not always be obvious to them. And perhaps they need help understanding how all of this connects and, and drawing yeah. out the implications. Um, yeah, I was, yeah, I was gonna, go ahead. Well, I, I was, I was going to say that, I mean, what, that there's a, there's a danger here too um because i mean we, we've been talking about you know scri- sufficiency and clarity of scripture and you know what does that not mean and well what it doesn't mean is what kind of rome caricatures it's to mean um and it and it is meant to exclude what rome teaches as the alternative so i mean you you, you understand lutheran doctrine in dialogue with and in contradiction to other systems of doctrine um and yet you don't you don't really want to devote the the minimal time that you have with your congregation on a sunday morning or a wednesday evening you know simply explaining why everyone else is wrong right you know, we're going to do an eight-week series on why everyone else is wrong um, <laughs> um i mean the, the, there are certainly times and places for that mm-hmm. um but that's interesting, though, because you read, say, like Luther's sermons or mm-hmm. uh, Johann Gerhard's sermons or even Walther's sermons, there is usually within their structure, their outline, their manuscript, there is usually some sort of um, taking on of a particular doctrine that is under attack at that time. Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. And and this, it, yeah, I mean this this leads to to a whole. I don't know if we want to go down this rabbit trail, but um, <laughs> I mean the, the 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 question of the place of teaching mm-hmm. in sermons. Um, I, I I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine in in graduate school, uh, and he was reformed and and very much in the tradition of expository preaching where you're in the pulpit for 45 minutes and what you're doing is, is kind of logically walking them through, you know, six verses uh, and, and teaching it. Um, and I explained to him that I, you know, I went to church with him one time and I explained, I was a little bit disappointed because I, I, I heard the word explained, but I didn't feel like I had heard the word proclaimed. Um, mm-hmm. I, 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 did, I didn't feel like law and gospel had been proclaimed to me. I felt like I was sitting in a classroom and, and having the Bible taught to me the, the way I would have anything else taught to me. Um, and so we had this conversation about you know the, the, the difference between perhaps a Reformed and a Lutheran understanding of what's happening in the pulpit. And he, he asked me, well, then when do you actually teach scripture to the people? And I said, well, I mean, that's, that's what Bible class is for. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, I, I don't think that's a hard and fast rule, and I and I don't think it should always be the case that you know we, we make that firm distinction and and say that well you know what, what what you're doing in the pulpit is you know proclaiming the forgiveness of sins, and then what you're doing in Bible study is uh, a bit more academic explanation of what Scripture teaches. I mean that's mm-hmm. a that's a really simplistic dichotomy, and it's not an either or, obviously. But I mean, on the whole, I don't, I don't think most Lutheran preaching is particularly didactic. Yeah, probably not. Um, probably not the uh, the majority of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's probably safe to say. Yeah, uh, I do know that it is. Uh, it, it, it is a struggle because it, it kind of hel- uh, it's kind of nice when you can make a hard and fast distinction between Bible class and preaching. Uh, it's neat, it's tidy. <laughs> right. uh, uh, but then again, you know, um, 
I only see a third of the people in Bible class that are actually in church on Sunday. No, and I right. begin to wonder how, you know, how, how am I going to help them uh, to engage uh, the scriptures and the, uh, the doctrines of the church in, 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 in a thinking way so that they can, you know, have that in their, their own minds and hearts to be used and applied as they live out their lives in the world. And it, it, it's a struggle to figure out how much should be, as you said, proclamation and how much uh, should be teaching it, it, without a burdening or overburdening the people in 45 minute sermons. No, that's right. That's right. So, yeah, it's a, uh, we're not going to answer the question here. That's for sure. <laughs> but it does give you food for thought. I mean, in terms of really what, what are the things that are, uh, you know, our people are struggling with, you know, that we do a really great job on the whole. And for the most part with, uh, with teaching the grammar stage, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. giving the uh, giving them the what, uh, and where we uh, aren't as good, uh, at least at this point in our history, uh, is uh, connecting those dots, teaching them the why, um, and the what next, you know, what what, what follows from that. No, that's right, um, and. Uh, it gives us at least a goal to aim at in the future, some kind of problem sol solving to puzzle through on how do we begin to recapture instilling that logic stage and then even their ability to rhetorically speak about it with those uh, with whom they come into contact uh, on a daily basis. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks for your time, Corey. I appreciate your insights into uh, helping us uh, remember, uh, by way of reminder, right? Uh, remember what we actually mean by sola scriptura, by the sufficiency of scripture, and by its clarity, uh, and uh, giving us some food for thought on you know how to move forward and how to be uh, better theologians and better members of Christ Church. So thanks again. Well, thanks for having me. All right, take care. Bye bye. Thank you.